This is the Living History Podcast, broadcasting live across the airwaves. Hello everyone, welcome to Living History and my special guest this week is Dan Carlin and I'm sure a lot of you know Dan Carlin, he is one of the world's most popular historians. He was recently dubbed America's History Professor. His hardcore history podcast gets millions of downloads and he is really someone who knows a lot about the world of history. It's a delight to have him on the show. Dan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'd like to correct you, though. I'm not a historian, and I'm pretty vociferous about saying that only because uh, I don't do any original work, and I'm a real fan of those people who get out there and do the digging for us, and then I sometimes translate their digging into fun stories. That's my job. (laughs) Fair enough, and you do it very, very well. I mean, a lot of our listeners, a lot of feedback I constantly get on my podcast is, did you hear the latest episode of Dan Carlin's podcast? So it's really wonderful, the work that you're doing in the history space, whether you call yourself a historian or not. Just give us a bit of background, Dan. How did you end up um, you know, being this, uh, this, this mouthpiece for history around the world? You know, it's funny. I keep telling my wife that I feel like I learn more about or understand more about history as I get older and have some of your own personal history to look back on. Because when I see how improbable some of the moves and the strange timing is in my own life, I kind of extrapolate that out to some of the great figures in history that we read about or whatever and start to realize, oh, it was probably like this for most people. And I feel like I have a better understanding of of how some of those things go because my life is a perfect example. If you went to school saying, you know, I want to grow up and do what I do for a living right now, how could you have possibly studied that? in the 1980s when I was going to school. So it's just, it's interesting how timing lines up with where you happen to be at the moment. I was a, um, a radio broadcaster and somebody back in like 1995 had said, I wanna put your radio show on the internet. And I didn't even know what he was talking about back in 1995. And But that started the whole thing of this, this convergence in my mind about uh, you might be able to do the audio stuff and have people download it. And that meant that when podcasting or MP3s or any of the pre-podcasting stuff first showed up, it was a right place, right time kind of moment. I was already in a space where uh, I wasn't learning how to use a microphone anymore. I was past that level, certainly. But at the same time, I wasn't. I had some friends who were really too old and established in radio to pivot like that. It, it, It seemed like too much of a gamble for them. So I was just in that sweet spot where I could both be professional about it, but at the same time, take advantage of something where the timing was just right. And I'm starting to look at other figures in history and think to myself, ah, I can see where Julius Caesar, not to compare myself to great figures, but you can see where these great figures, aha, there's a fork in the road in their life. And if they hadn't made that left turn, where would they be now? I look at my life now all the time and look back on it and go, God, if I hadn't made that left turn way back there, where would I be today? Well, you mentioned technology, and I think we live in a fascinating era, and especially when you compare it to previous eras. And technology, in some ways, gets a bad reputation because of you know problems on the internet and Twitter and things like that. But one thing that I am very excited about is it does give everyone a voice. And it's wonderful now that if you have some knowledge and something to say about any topic, history or cooking or golf or anything at all that excites you, you can now have a platform. That comes with good and bad things. But I mostly think it comes with very positive benefits. Do you do you perceive the modern era in that way? You know, it's funny because this actually ties into your last question about how we were talking about timing. And uh, I was involved in what we were calling back in the late 90s, early 2000s, amateur content. And what you just said to me was almost my exact investor pitch, where I was going out to these people saying, uh, you're going to have all this amazing stuff online. You're going to have a bazillion people. You know, we were basically pitching things like YouTube or anything like that. And the answer that people had at the time was that no one was going to be interested in it because the quality was going to be so low. And what I had said to them was, you know, it's a line I use all the time, a quantity has a quality all its own. And when there's enough stuff out there, there's going to be some stuff that's really interesting and good. And so now fast forward to where we are today, and, and there I was selling that idea. And I'm actually watching society try to deal with it now. And I'm finding it both interesting and slightly horrifying only because I really feel like we're in an in uncharted water right now, that we have systems that were put in place under the old rules, right? Whatever the old rules were. But you know, the systems we have now are legacy systems that go back to at least the mid-20th century, depending on you know what we're talking about. 
And yet we have these challenges. And one of them is the amazing amount of um, amplification we all have in being able to speak and make our opinions known and all these things. And these are not challenges that our society necessarily had evolved to incorporate. I mean, you can see the pressure it puts on totalitarian or really repressive regimes, for example. But it has a, a similar destabilizing effect to a lesser degree, even to systems like the United States or Australia or Britain or Scandinavia or anywhere else. And I think it's rather interesting to watch what we're still in the really early phases of this. My kids are... I tell my oldest kid that this whole world that she thinks is like concrete set in stone is about as old as she is. The texting, the cell phones, the the uh, instant access to the Internet. And we're still sort of, if you'll pardon the ad, we're guinea pigging this still and seeing how not just the human beings, but the the systems that we have in place uh, uh, handle this and flexibility wise. So I feel like you do overall that I, I can't imagine going back to the way things were. But I find the challenge itself to be um, interesting in a scary kind of way. I mean, human beings have always been fairly adaptable and have always sort of found a way to muddle through. And I think it's a really interesting era where we're no longer re- relying on distribution anymore. It used to be the case that book publishers controlled the book industry and movie studios controlled movies and, and, and music studios controlled music. We're in an era now where everyone uh, has a voice. Do you think uh, do you think human beings are good at navigating these changing times, these turbulent times? At the moment, it's an era related to communication and technology, but in the past, it's been all sorts of things that we've had to negotiate. Do, do, in your experience, in your in your estimation, are humans good at navigating these these difficult changing times? Well, I think the short answer is yes, or we wouldn't be here. I mean, we sort of pride ourselves on our adaptability. I mean, a couple of the chapters that my book starts out with, we start with plasticity and and the question of humans' ability to adapt. So there's no question that we're adaptable. Um, And I do think that that it's maybe too early to judge. So, you know, as a 53-year-old guy, hopefully I'm not like getting to that point where I'm romanticizing the past and and denigrating everything going on now, because it's very easy to say that we're still in in the transition phase here. So all of this could still turn out absolutely awesomely uh, once we have some time to get used to it and things to adapt. I mean, imagine what our whole informationally connected world. And by the way, you are using almost my exact pitch. I mean, we were talking about the gatekeepers of content and all that stuff. Um, it, It would be interesting to see what 20 years from now or 25 years from now, all of this has wrought, both good and bad. I think I think this is the kind of stuff that can destabilize governments, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It depends on the government we're talking about. But this is about so much more than just somebody in their basement being able to podcast or everybody being able to post their opinion. It is truly something that human beings have never been able to do on this scale. And it's it's you know what it is? It's it's exhilarating in the sense that anything that is historically new and unusual opens up vast possibilities to anything you want to imagine. And then whether or not you're imagining something good or bad may be based on whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. As we move forward, Dan, do you think it's important that we continue to look back, that we can we continue to analyze history, ch- chapters of history that have come before? Is that important in the 21st century? Oh, God, that's like shooting a fish in a barrel, as we say over here with me, because, I, I mean, of course, I'm going to say it is. that, But that's, you know, I have this theory that people who naturally are drawn to history, that that's the way they're hardwired mentally, that they see that that that's how they organize their mind in a sort of a linear sense where there's context based on, okay, A happened, then B happened, then C happened, and here we are. I have a friend who does the same thing mathematically. And so in my mind, I uh, I think I couldn't answer it any other way because that's how I sort of frame my whole world. And that's how I sort of decide, okay, how does this look to me? Well, what happened before? What happened over here? So, I mean, even in the book we're talking about, I, I use these sorts of scenarios that have happened before as ways, you know, I mean, it's an old line. I hardly came up with it, but as ways to sort of hold a mirror up and say, you know, does this look like us at all? And and would it look like us in similar circumstances? So my answer to your question is yes, but, I, but I'm geared towards saying that, I think. Yeah, I, I certainly agree. But I, I think the fascinating thing we hear all the time about learning lessons from history but I've got to be honest, I don't see a lot, uh, you know, in modern times where people are looking back and going, oh, maybe we should change our behavior based on what went before. Do you, you know, it seems to me like humans are, are, are doomed to repeat these same errors. We just can't seem to help ourselves. 
We have a problem maybe with interpretation. So, I mean, I, I think most historians wince when they hear things like lessons of history because they, they imagine some talk show host here in the United States saying that what the Munich Agreement in 1938 taught us is we can never make agreements with dictators. But, you know, in other words, it doesn't teach specific things like that at all. And that's a misuse of the idea. But what history does seem pretty good at is showing us what happens when lots of human beings get together and let's just, for example, panic, right? Or get scared or, I mean, there's certain ways that that on individuals, we can be very different person to person, but we sort of devolve to the emotional mean when you take us in groups. And for me, history is a wonderful example of the power of things like mass hysteria and all the sorts of things that you can see uh, I think in our in our society right now, I mean, the perfect example is this whole question right now of, uh, I think in the United States, especially, but globally of, of what we used to call news when I was a kid, but what now maybe you would call propaganda. How do you figure out, you know, how to navigate your way around stuff like that? Um, the, the problem is, is that there are certain things that seem to resonate and recur. And, and to me, they seem valid when we're talking about sort of mass human psychological things and, and invalid when we're talking about very specific, uh, you know, you can't, you know, I mean, it's the old line about you should know that you shouldn't invade Russia in the winter time. I mean, to me, that's a, a historical lesson, but specifically finding out about how to behave in certain circumstances doesn't apply. So, so I, I just tend to think that that circumstances are so different that certain things don't apply, but human beings are relatively constant. I hate to fall back on a trope like that, but I, I think that that's, I mean, I think if I took, and I've always said this, if I take a human infant from now, they're genetically the same as people from the past. You raise them in the 16th century and they're going to enjoy watching public executions. So, I mean, it, it, it's a context thing. And I think when we get in groups, we revert to, to, the, to, to something that the Romans or the ancient Greek writers would completely understand, which is why I think those things are valuable because we haven't changed that much, but you brought it up yourself. We're living in an era where the communication levels are unprecedented. And so that makes some of the context moot because I mean, where's the analogy for the times we live in now historically? I can't think of anything. No, I certainly agree with that. And, and it, it always strikes me when we talk about lessons of history. I mean, it's an overused phrase. And when we talk about it, we tend to mean the negative. People say, oh, well, the rise of the Nazis or, you know, <laughs> they, they, everyone always looks at the negative aspects, the Holocaust. Um, but I, I also think if we are learning lessons from history, there's positives that come out of it as well. You know, League of Nations, um, you know, countries getting on better with each other, peaceful times that we've had in the last 50 years or so. I mean, th there are positives that come out of lessons of history as well, aren't, aren't they? Oh, absolutely. And I, you know, I actually, because I'm, I'm sort of a, uh, this is just the way I think, but I, I almost juxtaposition the negatives with the positives. So you mentioned something like the League of Nations. Well, the League of Nations was a result of the, of the shock that all the major countries had after the First World War, right? So it almost, you have this terrible thing, and then out of those ashes, a seed grows towards what most people consider progress. All this stuff is now optional these days. But but I, I see what you're saying absolutely in terms of, uh, you know, if the old line Will Durant wrote many years ago, and I, I, I won't be able to quote it verbatim, but it was something about how, um, you know, most of history is really people having children, making their individual lives, going about their daily business, just struggling to survive and enjoy themselves. But historians are concerned with the blood and the war and all the things that are going on um, you know, that make the news. In other words, the same things that would make your headlines in the newspapers today tend to make it in the history books. And he said something like historians are blind because they focus on the river and not the mundane, banal things going on on the banks, which make up the majority of human experience and the majority of human enjoyment and positivity and all those things you were referring to. So not only do I agree with you, I think historians have always been able to recognize the blind spot that, you know, we used to say in news, if it bleeds, it leads. And historians kind of you know, traditionally, if it bleeds, it leads. Things make it in the history book more often, too. Well, Dan, let's talk about your new book, because a lot of these uh, these broad topics we've been touching on in the interview so far are, are neatly uh, uh, encapsulated in your book. So the book is The End is Always Near. Why don't you give us the quick, uh, you know, the quick summary of, of what it's all about? Well, it actually sort of like one of those ink blot tests that a psychiatrist might give somebody in the old days, because my editor said to me, you know, surely you have a lot of things in the files. Go back and see if there's any connecting threads to them. And it's funny because when I do these podcasts, I do them individually. I don't think about them as having any broadly connecting themes. So I was going through my old work going, 
holy cow, I'm really interested in the end of civilization. I'm really interested in these recurring challenges that force human beings to adapt and respond. And so that's kind of what the book is about. So it has a couple chapters that broadly, these are, I would call them loosely connected vignettes, by the way, rather than uh, anything that makes a concise argument, because I'm a podcaster who deals with questions, if that makes sense. You've heard the show. I don't give answers. Uh, I'm not qualified to give answers, but I, I deal with these questions that have always fascinated people. They're some of the deep, you know, why are we here kind of historical questions. And in this book, we try to look at circumstances where those questions have come into play and then ask how we might respond if the same thing happened to us. And many of these same things that we deal with are recurring human challenges. And it's almost weird that we haven't had to deal with them in a while. So for example, take disease or pandemics or black plagues or Justinian's plagues or any of those things that throughout human history is part of the human condition. Well, we really, I mean, you know, with some notable exceptions, don't deal with that anymore or haven't dealt with them lately or don't deal with them in most of the world anymore. So I love wondering about the question of recurrence. Is this a recurring human challenge that we have banished forever because of modern medicine and all of the things you and I have been talking about? Or are we just in an intermediary period between terrible pandemics and we're going to see this again? And if we see it again, can we learn anything from other times when, when it's, it's, it's been around? Uh, and so the book kind of looks at those. So we have pandemics, we have uh, systems collapse, like when the end of the Bronze Age happened and for no apparent reason that anyone can absolutely finger, an entire system, a connected, interconnected world went down. So we look at that and ask, could that happen today? What would it be like if it did? And, and what might have done it? So the book is about recurring human challenges and our ability to adapt and evolve to deal with them. What were the, uh, what were the parts of the book, Dan, that, that most spoke to you, that were, were the most stimulating to write? That, I mean, I won't say favourites because that seems a bit, a bit banal, but what were, the, uh, what were the parts that you felt were, 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 that you could get your teeth into the most? Uh, there are part, you know, every chapter has something in it that has totally fascinated me. So there's one that's part of the human plasticity idea that has to do with toughness. And I've always been interested in this, in this amorphous human question of toughness because I think it's something we can all recognize has some sort of value, but that we also recognize is culturally determined, impossible to measure or quantify. And so, so one chapter has that fascinating idea to, to me anyway in it. But the chapter, if you talk about getting your teeth into something, there's a chapter in the book that sort of leads up to the nuclear war chapter. And it's a chapter that basically deals with how the heck do basically well-meaning human beings ever get to a point where it's it sounds like a good idea and accepted behavior to wipe out millions and millions and millions of fellow humans. And so that chapter has to do with the growth of what's called strategic bombing, the bombing of cities in the, in the, the two world wars especially. And so that chapter speaks to me somehow because it kind of shows how human beings thinking that they are doing the best of things ends up creating a situation that today you can't even get your mind around. Dan, having explored all these chapters of history and obviously a lot of dark chapters of history, how does it make you feel about how we're going as a species now? I mean, are we doing well? We have this incredible arrogance that we're the best humans have ever been. And, and as you say, that nothing bad is ever going to happen again. We've banished disease and war and everything else. I mean, how, how do you feel after researching all this that we're going as a species? You know, I don't know the answer to that question. It's part of kind of what I'm sitting back, I think, and observing these days. I keep trying to wonder whether, um, you know, like like I look at the complexity of society, of modern society, and I keep, at, you know, if you look at the pace of change and you look at what, how long your experience would have served you well a thousand years ago versus today when you won't be able to use the new smartphones 15 years from now, you'll have to have your kids show you. So I, I look at those kinds of questions and I try to figure out um, whether or not the complexity of modern society will at some point outstrip the average human's ability to deal with it. So are we getting smarter as a species or are people as, as I mean, if IQ is a terrible way to measure human intelligence, but for the sake of our argument, let's just use IQ. If the IQ for the average human being has remained the same since caveman times, and I don't think it has, but let's just imagine, does an increasingly complex society at some point outstrip you? And so 
for me, I mean, that's what I look at. I think for most of human history, things have changed so slowly. Human beings have had plenty of time to adapt. And now we're under a, a level of pressure we've never seen before. And so many of the questions you and I have just discussed today have been about whether or not this is a good thing or a bad thing or whether it's leading to a good or a bad future. And I don't know because I think a lot of it has to do with the chapters, the first two chapters of my book about our ability to be plastic and adapt. And I'm not sure what being plastic and adapt to this world, which as I tell my daughter is 10 or 12 years old, if we're talking about the texting, cell phone, online at the fingertips world. Um, I don't have the answer to that question. I feel like we're all sort of on the couch eating popcorn, watching a historical age unfold that they're going to write about in the future. Are you optimistic about that future? I don't know. I, I Here's the thing. Even when I'm optimistic, I do think that there's some cataclysmic changes in the future, just as the imbalances that we talked about earlier, right? The imbalances between the level of individual communication and the amplification of people's opinions and the ability of old governmental systems designed for previous eras to adapt to that. I think you see it in Iran. I think you see it in China. I think you see these places that are having a harder time. But I think that's I think they're ahead of the curve. I think the democratic, more open societies will see similar challenges a little farther down the line. And so I think that you're going to it's going to force some sort of adaptation. And the adaptation can be a peaceful evolution based on uh, progress and updating and, and, and whatnot, or it can be something where you have to break a few eggs to make progress or take a step back to take two steps forward. And I don't think that's very fun to live through sometimes. And so, I, I, so when you say, are you optimistic or pessimistic? I think on the long term, I'm optimistic. I'm not sure that uh, we're not living close to a time when a few eggs are going to be broken. So I, I suppose it, it depends on whether or not you're you're there to cash in on the results or whether or not you're just the guy who has to pick up the check at the restaurant. <laughs> we may be in a, a historical check pang period. <laughs> well, I'm uh, I'm I'm apprehensive and also looking forward to see how to see how this unfolds. But I think your book is a uh, you know a fantastic resource for people to at least sit back and and analyze what has come before. I, I don't think we're very good at that anymore. We're not very good at sitting back and 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 analyzing and, 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 and even pausing to think about what's come before. And, and so that's why I think your book and, and examples like it are, are really important in that in this modern era. I wish I had thought to bring that up because I do think that's such an amazing point, which is that, you know, the the, fi the so-called five minute or five second attention span or whatever it is. Do we lose something not having people who have so little to do that they can simply sit and think for long? I mean, do we miss some like intense concentration power or not? I that's a perfect example, though, of the kind of questions that the book deals with. There is no right answer to that. You couldn't really measure it or study it or prove it, yet it might be one of the more important questions for our future. So I find those things fascinating. I'm so glad you brought that up. What about uh, hardcore history? What's uh, what, what are you working on on the podcast at the moment? Because the, the oh, podcast... we are so close. It's really we are fascinating. so close, man. It's, it's so fast. awful right now. You, the, the, it's really interesting. It's not a formula for podcasts that that anyone would say is a, is a likely way for podcasts to work. Each episode is very very long. They don't come out particularly frequently, but they're so immensely popular. So, tell us a bit about the podcast and what you've got coming up. Uh, we are we are. But this book slowed me down. Needless to say, I, I thought I was going to be able to keep a bunch of plates spinning, and you know Murphy's law intervenes, and all the plates start wobbling at the same time. And so uh, this is the latest show in terms of how long it's been since the previous show we've ever done. So it's driving me nuts, and we're so we're so close. I mean, by the time this comes out. The show should have come out. So it's a little like we always say, like college final exams around here. Lots of pizza boxes, tons of caffeine, and it looks like a bomb went off in my studio. But we're getting pretty close to installment number three of the story of the um, Asia Pacific theater in the Second World War. And I'm a little distraught because it, it, it's going to be another one of these many hours long shows and we don't get that far in the story. So I'm just probably getting more long winded as I get older. But but by the end of October, we should have the next Hardcore History out and hopefully it is never this long between shows again. Well, I think, you know, everything that you're doing, Dan, you just have a great ability to speak to people and to to make these complicated topics um, consumable for average people and, and understandable. So I think it's it's really wonderful. What else have you got coming up? I mean, in, in the busy plate spinning world with uh, podcasts and books, what are we going to see next from Dan Carlin? Uh, I have a um, 
they call it an immersive experience. I think we would have called it virtual reality a few years ago. Uh, an immersive experience uh, of a World War One um, experience that's going on right now. It's it's sort of instead of a virtual reality experience at your home, it's one where the entire environment can be controlled. So you could control um, the haptics, for example. So the in this, um, I don't know if I've explained it very well, but it's essentially an experience. You go to some place, you walk in, they put the gear on you and you start walking through a first world war trench and a first world war experience and the trench is actually there so if you reach out and touch it you'll feel the trench you feel wind you feel the sound of the shells hitting there are big speakers underneath your feet so it's this experience designed to really force you you know we talked a second ago about the, uh, the ability to concentrate or focus um, well, if you're at home and you've got the virtual reality headset on and your phone rings, maybe you stop or somebody walks in the room. So we wanted to be able to control your entire environment and not let you get away for 15 minutes or something. So we immerse you in this world where you can touch and feel everything. Uh, everything looks like it's real. The sound was done by Skywalker Sound that did the Star Wars things. Uh, and that's on tour right now. So that's going on at the moment. And people seem to like that. And that took up a lot of time this year, too. So hopefully it's just podcasts for a while after this. Well, Dan, it's it's absolutely extraordinary the work you're doing. And I appreciate you taking time out of your very busy schedule to, to stop and talk to us. Uh, we'd love to get you back on the show again in the future and, uh, and keep this wonderful discussion about history going. But uh, just thank you so much for joining us on Living History. Thank you for saying all of the nice things. My goodness, I, I appreciate it. And thank you so much for having me on.